GB, no GQ. Giles Brown. Creo que sí. The Newsmongers, a history of tabloid journalism, is a, a look shining a light on the often seedy world of tabloid journalism from the first printed strange news, strangely strangely spelt, uh, from the 16th century to the sensationalism of today's digital age. Delighted to say that joining me live is the man behind The Newsmongers. Gotcha. It's Terry Kirby. Terry, good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon, Charles. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to have you with us. What's your What's your background into shining a light onto the into the the often hysterical world of tabloid journalism? Well, I was a broadsheet journalist for many years. I started off on local papers. I was a fan member of staff of the Independent and worked there for twenty one years. And then I worked for various other publications. I have worked for. Uh, tabloid newspapers. I worked a little bit for the Daily Mail many, many years ago, and I worked for the Evening Standard. I've never, I've never worked on a full-blooded red top <laughs> tabloid, as as I gather you have. But um, I, I, on many, I was a crime correspondent for many years and chief reporter of the Independent. So I've seen the tabloids in action. I know quite a few tabloid journalists, knew quite tabloid journalists. So I've seen them in action. I've watched them very, very closely over the years. You make them sound like some sort of strange subspecies, like, you know, like the sub-editors are, who are always looking at the last train table home. Uh, no, I, I, no, I don't believe they are. There are, there are a great many brilliant tabloid journalists out there. I have no... no um, uh, no overriding condemnation of tabloid journalists, as, as indeed some people do. Oh, I think tabloid newspapers perform an absolutely vital function. It's when, uh, and I try and document that in the book. I mean, there are there are a great many things that tabloid newspapers have have done really well, particularly in communicating um, important issues in a straightforward and simple way to the broader public. Um, tabloid newspapers. If you uh, if you go back to the beginnings of, say, the Daily Mail, which doesn't consider it as a tabloid, but it was the founder of the Daily Mail, Alfred Hansus, was the man who actually gave the word tabloid to the to, to the nation, and he worked to the world, and he was he never considered the Daily Mail to be a tabloid. The Daily Mail does not now consider itself a ta- newspaper, but it but it was brilliant right at the outset in catering for areas of sections of the population that were not previously catered for the you know the less slightly less well educated not the kind of leisured literary classes of the kind of victorian era um and and for women um yeah. most you know in, in the high heyday uh, of of serious victorian broadsheet journalism as espoused by the times and the telegraph and so forth you know it didn't cater for women it catered for chaps reading it in their clubs and the Daily Mail catered brilliantly for women. So, there's a, there, and if you want to go on, the Daily Mirror in the post-war era catered for the um, the returning uh, uh, servicemen and women. Uh, catered for the you know covered the welfare state, the birth of the welfare state, the birth of modern modern Britain as we know it today, and was a very much considered a voice of the people. Yeah, I mean, what, 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 where does the tabloid come from? Because we use it, don't we, all the time? But yeah. I've never actually yeah. considered until you said that where where tabloid comes from. Well, the, the interesting thing was I was sort of about a third of the way through the book, and a, a, a friend of mine, Nina, uh, said, "Where does the word tabloid come from?" And I thought, uh, I was about to say, <laughs> I explain, and I actually realised I didn't know. So I did a fairly little bit of research, and it's found out there. Tabloid was a, was a combination of tablet and alkaloid, and it was a name given in the late Victorian era to a type of concentrated pill. And it became kind of fairly sort of well-known uh, as a name for anything concentrated um, and in a small form. And what happened was that Alfred Harmsworth, um, later Lord Northcliffe, um, an incredible person in his own right, we could talk about him all afternoon, but he he was asked to edit the New York Post on the 31st of um, December 1901, which many believe was the first, or was with the paper the following morning, January 1st, would be the first paper of the new century, because at that point, they believed the new century started in 1901, not 1900. Right. Uh, um, uh, and, and he was asked to edit a copy of the New York Post by um, uh, by them. And he 
he uh, on his front page he had this sort of mission statement and he said this is my this is my tabloid concentrated version of 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 newspapers and he cut down the size of the paper he cut down the story length he had brighter headlines bigger headlines and if you like that was even though kind of what you might call tabloid values have been in existence for some time particularly among what was known as the american yellow press um uh, uh but the tabloid shape um the tabloid what we look and see as a tabloid yeah. really began about then because and that's what I'm against because this, the the thing is i mean people can deride tabloids but if you look at those early victorian news sheets that are the newspapers you know telegraph of times talk about i mean obviously they don't have photographs but the amount of text it is absolutely for a gentleman sitting in his club with a cigar, yeah. uh, and it's going to yeah. take him most of the afternoon to get through yeah. it. Yeah, and of course, there, you know, there were no other forms of entertainment at that point. You know, there was no television, there wasn't radio. People had lots and lots of time to do this kind of thing. They could sit there um, and and read long court reports, long parliamentary reports, long kind of dispatches from the empire. Um, and that was that was that was kind of normal, and, and none of it was really aimed at, as I said, aimed at women. It was aimed at a certain type of kind of educated, um, upper middle class, middle class male reader, and th- that was also the, the case pretty much, you know, in the states as well. Um, and what you had in the states was a was a kind of war between newspapers, more populist orientated newspapers run by William uh, Randolph Hearst, mm-hmm. who everyone knows was a model for Citizen Kane, and a guy called Joseph Pulitzer, who n- not many people know of today, but was the name given to the prize, which, you know, is, is a sort of benchmark of excellence in, in American journalism, still is, very much so. But Pulitzer was a much uh, less well-known character than than Hearst, but um, and had very very good values. But both men were were um, pretty brutal in treating their staff. They were and they were very much prepared to to cut corners. And there was a there was a a, a, a sort of incredible war between them, which oh, and a war over cartoon characters, which ended up with a um, with with the name of yellow journalism, hey, and hey. that was. Uh, that was their label for tabloid journalism. A war over cartoon characters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a there was a there was a character that was um, he was known as the Yellow Kid, and he was a character in a in a in a in a sort of strip cartoon that ran in um, in one of these newspapers. That was a um, uh, they were sort of kids from the Bowery slums of New York, and one wore a kind of oversized yellow t shirt. Uh-huh. Or vest, and um, it was then, um, and the, they, the the cartoonist who stole, uh, who did this, was stolen um, by one newspaper from the other, and then the original newspaper went back and and created their own version of the Yellow Kid, so it became as the known as the Yellow Yellow Newspaper Wars, and the Yellow Label of Yellow Journalism stuck, and it's still still used today in America, but it, it's not it's not really used today in the in the in 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 UK or Europe. Right. Okay. Well, let's let's go back let's go back into time as the saying goes, because. Um, Pamphleteers, you know, people get hold of the, of the printing press. We're thinking about the coffee, you know, the coffee shops of ye old Fleet Street and stuff, and the coffee houses. Um, the things called what are they strange newses or something. How do you pronounce it? News, yeah. news with an ND. Yeah, this was a, this was a label that was sort of given. Um, it was their kind of version in the late fifteenth and early sixteenth century. This is their version of exclusive. Right. And that strange news will be put on a label. Funnily enough, I was I was at a uh, at a, a, a Shakespeare play, Much Ado About Nothing, the other night, and and one of the characters announcing something about another character, Benedict. If you know the plot of Much Ado About Nothing, Benedict is introduced to the to the other members of the cast by saying, "I have strange news for you." About Benedict, ah. so it was, it was in common usage in those in those in that era to denote something interesting or unusual, and so strange news was used as a kind of bit of a label on these 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 news sheets that were printed. And what there was a sort of division between 
There were news sheets that were printed that were all about political or military developments. Again, there was a sort of division between the kind of serious stuff and the more lighthearted stuff. But there were lots of other news sheets with the kind of strange news labels. And, and they would, they would, um, uh, cover things in in their own language about things which m- today we would probably describe as natural phenomena or weird medical things like you know what they would call mutant children right. or you know, you know they, they or or strange beasts uh, roaming the countryside outbreaks of sort of plague and fire which were usually attributed to natural causes but they would give them some other kind of you know extra so you know, it's, uh, it's the end of it's the end of days, etc. You know, get get yourself end to the nearest chapel. Days, you yeah. know, and I, I mean, I, ironic, and you know, otherworldly beasts kind of patrolling the, the the forest and that kind of thing. And 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 ironically, today, you know, we we still have that kind of thing with aliens abducted my sister headlines on the in the Daily Star and the and the, and the American National Enquirer. Well, the thing is, though, you see, I I've, I draw this line here. Or I draw a connection. Maybe it's just me, but I still think that. The the pamphleteers and people putting this out without any editors and just whacking out in the streets is basically a precursor to today's today's internet and and fake yeah. news because you can you can throw what you like out there saying you know the world is run by a cable of six foot subterranean hamsters yeah. called Nigel yeah. and and you'll find a website yeah. for it. Yeah, well, that was you know that was very much the tone of of some of those uh, of some of those early news sheets, particularly. Th- but they they love things like grisly murders and. You know, strange sort of occurrences, which now we we would very quickly find out why. You know, there were people hanging up in forests, disemboweled and things. But they they would, uh, you know, that that would be, you know, a, a, a perfect fodder for these for these early news sheets. Let, let's let's uh, let's, let's uh, yeah, sorry. Let's leave people hanging upside down and disemboweled in 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 the New York State, shall we? And and, and come yeah. back to the twentieth century. Yeah. This was, but they, they, I should say, these were very much a British thing. That wasn't so much in this, in America because American commerce originally was uh, American uh, pop journalism was originally a very serious matter, and it was all around commerce. This was very much a British thing. Sorry, yes, the twentieth century. Because you, you, you mentioned you mentioned the mail. And and being and and targeting women, which is you know, which many people will scratch their heads at looking at now. But that whole, if you like, you you could say from 1945, you mentioned the Mirror, and and yeah. to a certain extent the Sun as well in the early days, and the sketches. Well, can you can we bring the sketch in here as well as a, as a tabloid? Is that perhaps a bit too too? Well, um, the, the sketch was very much in the middle market yeah. era of. Of, I mean, you, you, I mean, people talk about popular and, and, and tabloid and the, you know, the two things tend to be pretty much the same. But you had a, if you like, the broader sweat, popular newspapers would be the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Daily Sketch. Mm. And then the red tops would be at the, the, what we would consider to be classically uh, tabloid. That would be Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror. Um, the, um, what the sun from the 1969 onwards, yeah, uh, and and so forth, and that 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 is what we would classically consider tabloid. Although I do make the point in the book that the, what you might call the tabloid culture, the tabloid mentality, you know, today are sort of are spread by osmosis throughout popular culture. The, the thing is that during during that period, and you've got people coming back from the war, you know, allow, building a, a home for heroes, etc. National yeah. National Health Service comes in, housing programs. Yeah. Yeah. People want to be informed. There's a new Britain yeah. coming out, and, yeah. and the tabloids play an absolutely vital role in this. And if you look at the 50s, and especially the 60s, when papers like the Mirror take up campaigns, they are comp- campaigning journalists in a way that obviously today's aren't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the 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 mirror of the fifties and sixties was a great newspaper. It was the it was the newspaper that my parents took, and I I grew up grew up reading, and I can still remember the names of some of those some of those journalists. Um, William Connor Cassandra is a fantastic columnist. Um, Donald Donald Zek, who was a, a great show business writer. Philip Zek, his brother, who was a fabulous cartoonist. Um, and Marjorie Proops, the great woman's writer, the great columnist, model for many. Female journalists, um, 
And the, the mirror at that point, when it was sort of overseen by the great Sir Hugh later Lord, uh, mm. Hugh Cudlip, later Lord Cudlip, um, was a terrific newspaper. I mean, it was it was fated throughout the world. I mean, it, it was, I mean, in fact, going back a bit, when Hitler drew up his plans to invade uh, um, uh, Britain, uh, the, the senior officer, the executives of the Daily Mirror were on their list to be arrested immediately, you know, along right. with Winston. And, and political leaders and the mirror had a kind of incredible power in the land it was read by 12 million people um it was it was quite extraordinary um and it had this total dominance i mean it grew a bit fat and bloated um and it's a complete shadow uh, uh, today of what it of what it once was um but it was um it was a terrific um it was a terrific entity in those days and it was incredibly powerful i mean it was um, um it was you know uh, the the Labour politicians. Uh, you know Harold Wilson um, in that era. People like Harold Wilson in that era. You know would would be guided by whatever the Mirror editorial column said. You know they yeah. were. It was completely synonymous with the with the Labour Party. And it reflected. It's the sixties. It's in New Britain. It's a, you know trendy yeah. popular. So it's you know young people got spending money and they're yeah. buying buying the Mirror as well. Yeah. And of course, yeah. and of course, this is all happening in ye olde London Fleet Street. I mean, mirrors at Holborn yeah. Circus, expresses across the river, you know, in the building. Yeah. And so yeah. there's yeah. A, that immediacy as well. It's not they're not people, you know, working out of, of, of their home offices. Yeah, I mean, it was a completely different environment. Everybody in Fleet Street in that era, um, up until the kind of the the, the um, when the sun moved out at the end of the 1980s, in the middle of the 1980s. Um, and that started this exit from Fleet Street. But from, in fact, going right back from, from the earliest days, right up until um, until then, Fleet Street was the home of the printing industry. Yeah. It was also on these arterial routes in and out of London, which don't seem much now, but in those days they were much more important than they are today. And so... Um, and this, the, the, that's when newspapers could be printed and got to the railway stations very quickly or taken by road very quickly to different places before the railway station. But, but it was a, it was a center, certainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where every, all, all the journalists know each other. They each had their own watering holes. You would each be able to go to the, to the pub and you'd see all the, the people you were sitting next to. And there was a, you know, there was an incredible drinking culture. Um, in that period, I mean, there's there's one account in in, in my book of how um, uh, Hugh Cudlett would spend his days, and you know, there'd be every day was a lunching day, and that would mean you know aperitif, it would mean wine, it would mean a brandy afterwards, and then they start again in the evening. Um, to be fair, they were you know usually they would be working incredibly long days. These are people of um, twelve hour days were absolute normal. In fact, when I was in Fleet Street, you know twelve hour days were were the norm for many people. Um, so you know, you, but it, the whole thing was fueled by by alcohol socialising, um, and you know again it was, it was a very internal world. It was a very closed world. You couldn't get into it. Um, you know, I, I, it's a, not a story entirely, but you know, the, the whopping revolution and digital yeah. revolution expanded Fleet Street and uh, allowed a, you know, a much more diverse and different kind of culture to thrive. The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie. This, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to. I mean, it's, you have to mention, like him or loathe him, it takes the yeah. sun and it abs- and, and to a certain extent, it's Eddie Shaw and, and to, uh, who takes it to whopping, and everybody remembers that. But he took the yeah. sun and made it a phenomenon. You know, it's us what it's us what won it. Gotcha, of course, nineteen eighty two. Yeah. He yeah. took he took yeah. it in a whole different direction, and it just, in the words of you know, you know, it blew everybody else out of the water. Yes, it did. I mean, it was a. Um it was a remarkable serendipity in the sense that 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 Murdoch was able to buy the Sun for a pittance from Cudlip, as it happened, who'd taken the Daily Herald on, um, tried to reinvent it and didn't work out, and he was very happy to sell it to Murdoch. Um, uh, he, he'd actually known Murdoch's father, Keith, Sir Keith Murdoch, 
and thought he was a decent old cove and his son would be a decent chap to sell the paper to. And he never thought that it was going to do the anyway, but they were, they had to sell the paper. Otherwise the, the, they couldn't close it. Otherwise the print unions would have gone berserk. And what Murdoch did was in the space of like a month, reinvented the sun, completely changed it, turned it into a tabloid. He just took the name, sat at 90% of the staff and created a whole new paper right from the start in November 1969. And, um, and he hired Larry, ha- Larry Lamb, who was a, um, who must take some credit for the birth of the son, um, in, uh, as the editor. And Larry Lamb was a very hard nosed, very sharp, a journalist who had been schooled by the by the mirror under under Cudlip, and and uh, basically he sort of took the sun away and, and ran with it, given resources by Murdoch, and he turned the sun into what we know today. And it was all about sex. Yeah, it was all about sex and a kind of a kind of a seaside postcard. Well, the, pa- the page three girl, for example. Page right? three. I girl. Mean- that, that, that didn't come for another year yeah. after the. They launched it, but yeah, and it was all about that. It was make their 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 co- their, their phrase was um, make it sexy, not sleazy, and that, and so the whole point was you couldn't have it too provocative. You had to have quotes, nice girls, yeah. end quote, as as page three models, and they began to decorate the rest of the paper as well, and it was. Um, uh, and there was lots of features about, the, you know, they really broke the boundaries in talking about things like sex yeah. and women's issues and things like abortion and um, masturbation and, you know, sexual issues around uh, that. And, and they really did break some boundaries. They had a brilliant um, uh, women's uh, columnist, uh, Claire Rayner, for many years, Um uh, it was well liked and respected. Um, and, uh, and, yes, and they, they, yes, darling, yes, darling, yes. Tell me, lovey, tell me, lovey, darling. Yes, I mean that was Claire Rayner. And they talked. They they, they 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 talked about it in a in a kind of populist way, but not in a kind of sleazy way. And that and that was a good thing. And then Kelvin McKenzie comes along at, at, a, at a later date and completely kind of starts afresh and is um, and is this kind of. Ball of self confidence and energy, and you know, completely. Even Larry Lamb was very much old fleet. Kelvin McKenzie was very South London, very kind of. The self confidence was unbelievable. He, his attention to detail was unbelievable. His phrase was shock and amaze me on every page, mm. and, it, and it was a bit like that. And he was a workaholic. Uh, he was very, very sweary. He would shout people down at the side to it. And he kind of ruled by this sort of combination of, of, of terror, fear, but also a sight awe amongst the staff that anyone could be like that. And he was full of ideas and, and things. And then he, so he took the sun up to the next level. And the sun by then had already had this very close relationship with Margaret Thatcher, yeah. um, uh, from the, from the 1979 election. Um, uh, with with uh, that was Lamb who 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 you know gone down the road supporting Thatcher in the seventy nine election and and Kel and Mackenzie through the nineteen eighties which was sort of Pete Thatcher and Pete Sun would were you know they were they again they were as much a kind of partnership as the Daily Mirror was with Harold Wilson twenty years previously. Yeah, you're thinking red braces and huge mobile phones and, and the whole thing. News of the world, people, Sunday people, people don't mention. Now, that was that was the one that perhaps broke it all then because there are limits within journalism. I mean, the News of the World used to say their sex stories, they were always in brothels and they'd say, you know, we found out, we found a, a house of ill repute and we made our excuses and left. That was always the News of the World. And yet, yeah. and yet, Terry, those are the people, that is the paper that brings it all crashing down because they go way over the limits. Yeah, I mean, the News of the World was always a slightly special case. I mean, what was interesting is the News of the World, when it was first started, was highly respected as a newspaper. It had a, a very strong political coverage. It all, it had um, it had theatre critics. It had all the kind of things that you expect to see in the newspaper, and it was widely respected. And it became 
this kind of this oddity on a Sunday, and he would have um, uh, it, it, its big thing was court cases, and he would report all the court cases that hadn't found their way into the paper in the previous uh, into the daily papers in the previous week, and court cases. Uh, particularly ones involving sex or, 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 or some kind of sexual behaviour. You know, Randy Vickers, Vickers getting caught with their pants down in Brussels, in a suburban brothel was the typical yeah. news of the world story. <laughs> and, they do, you know, they do exposures about, as you say, high street, you know, high street brothels or places, um, uh, you know, above a local hairdressers or something like that. And they love that. And it was, you know, and these were suburban places that nobody really gave much worry, worry about anyway, but they would love to kind of expose them. And, but then, and, and it, then it kind of moved on from that. And, and, and sorry, just to go back a bit, you know, this was a paper that was sort of celebrated by George Orwell in his famous essay, famous essay um, uh, about uh, in, in, in Britain and the kind of culture of murder report of crime reporting, and he celebrated the idea of the news of the world. You know, as this is what you sort of read on a Sunday afternoon while you're digesting your roast Sunday dinner, you know? Um, uh, as he said in a beautiful Orwellian phrase, driven home, as it were, by a cup of brown tea. Um, uh, and and you, uh, 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 while smoking your pipe, obviously. And, and uh, this sort of, it, it was kind of, it was accepted as a sort of cultural thing, you know, and it was part of culture. It was a famous line for Tony Hancock shows about what you do on the Sunday afternoon when your board is to fill in the overs on the news of the world, scratching them out with your pen. And, uh, and, but it, it then, you know, as celebrity culture grew, it morphed into this thing that was just reporting celebrity stories. And that's the, the celebrity culture that we found in the kind of late 80s and 90s tended to dominate popular and tabloid journalism. And the news of the world was then driven by stories about uh, about footballers, about pop stars um, and um and yeah, you know, other you know the broadening of the celebrity, what we call the celebrity, yeah. which was driven by the reality shows and the the growth of those kind of areas. Um, anyone, the soaps as well, you know, the, the the huge growth of Coronation Street and particularly EastEnders and the other soaps, they became fodder for all the tabloids and the news of the world. And then you had the royals, who were the other kind of you know area that the tabloids would feast on and the news of the world just went further than anybody else in 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 pursuing those stories yeah uh, and using people like the late max clifford to who would sell them stories about you know the girlfriends or boyfriends of celebrities and yeah, is it the original kiss and, is the original kiss and tell, isn't it? My night, my night of passion kiss, with, et cetera, et cetera. A whole kiss, a whole kiss and tell thing became became a regular thing. And then they would when that what happened really was suddenly you had you would uh, you know up until then they'd use traditional methods, kiss and tell. They would buy stories from somebody or they would park their van with a photographer in a long range lens outside some celebrity's house and wait for them for their boyfriends or girlfriends to leave and take the shots or they follow them around on holiday or shopping or whatever. Yeah. Traditional journalistic methods. They may have been intrusive, but they were, you know, that was what they did. What happened then was you had suddenly in the nine, in the late eighties and the early nineties um, and throughout the nineties, you suddenly had technology, which had not been there before. You suddenly got mobile phones. You had Everything became much more digital and computerized, and this gave people access to things like you know, medical records can be hacked online, um, phones could be hacked, and you had this period when pe everyone had got a mobile phone, but people hadn't kind of, particularly celebrities, hadn't got the idea of using sort of security measures or pin passwords and so forth. Nothing like what we have now, and there was that period before people became much more digitally. In what we call today in infosec information yeah. security um uh people weren't as, as as switched on to that to coin a phrase um and they became and the the, the unscrupulous journalists were able to exploit this using a series of it's a long and complicated story which was all relayed in the leveson report and i do deal with it all in the book is 
using a range of different private eyes and private investigators. And these became passed around between journalists and they would, uh, and these people were therefore kept a slight arm's length uh, from 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 the newsrooms, they worked outside of newsrooms. Although some journalists figured out how to do it and worked inside newsrooms, and that's what all led up to the kind of eventually the closure of the News of the World and and the Leveson report. One thing they have done well, always tabloids, though, is sports reporting, isn't it? I mean, if you want to say, oh, like, yeah. you know, because you can say what you like about the Daily Mail, but I, I will always read the sports. I will read the nearest sport because that is the that is the the one area. If you can say the tabloids have gone down a hole now, and and the Daily Mail has got a very strange existence between on its main paper, it's about up for, you know, is about strict moral values, and the other time it's look it's like look at what Eva Longoria is wearing in a bikini. But the sports <laughs> reporting is still absolutely superb. It is. It, it is. I mean, they've always, always, always prided themselves on uh, extensive sport reporting. It has always been a strength of the uh, of, of of the tabloids and popular newspapers. And there has been some great sports reporters um, working for those those papers. I mean, particularly people like Ian Waldridge, who worked for the Daily Mail for many years, who was generally re- recognised as one of the great sports writers ever. Um, and there's still there's some very good ones out there now. Um, and because also it was seen as it was a new thing, you know, popular acceptance of sport became, again, this was much more of a kind of late Victorian, early 20th century thing. And it was with the the, the, the kind of rise of the, of the of the edge what you might call the educated working class who were able to read the papers and the, and the commuters um, and that's one thing we shouldn't uh, uh, forget in the kind of rise of the tabloids it was about an educated working class who needed to, uh, and a middle class a lower middle class who needed something to read on their way to work or on their lunch break from work evening standard on the way out of old street on a friday exactly what are you hoping <laughs> what are you hoping that people are going to are going to learn from this well, I think the interesting thing is, and I, again, I make this point in the book, is that by the time Leveson, uh, the, the the inquiry into the kind of whole hacking stuff, reported in 2012, things had moved on. The, the, the kind of era of what we call the dark arts of all the hacking and other stuff, even the intrusive stuff, the long lens stuff, had moved on. And, and because you then had a range of, 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 of celebrities and other people like the Kardashian clan, for instance, who would just put themselves out there on Instagram and, and TikTok and other sources, and their whole world is laid bare, to coin a phrase, out there, or, or nearly naked, um, for the tabloids to just hoover all this content up. And you've got everything from the what you might call grade A celebrities um, like the Kardashians, who are fully aware of what they're doing, very much in control of their own agenda, all their airbrush photographs and all the rest of it, down to, uh, uh, you know, the former page three girls running their own kind of sleazy sites on only fans. But the, the tabloids will still hoover that up and present it as stories. And and uh, again, as I make the point, but it's it's three likes and, and a... And a and a, and a block and all you've got uh, from tweets and, and Facebook and people hoover up these stories, um, usually about people who haven't been in the news at all. Mm. And, and they just run these uh, as clickbait stories on, on their websites. It just, it's never mind the quality of feel the width. You know, a, 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 you know, celebrity, you know, on the, on the breakfast television Couch wears a, a dress that's too short, uh, or yeah. present wears a dress that's too short, or a, a tie that's too 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 loud, and you merely got four people on 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 Twitter complaining about it or celebrating about it. That's the story. It's just turned turned over very very quickly. So they don't need to kind of hack the phones of these people because it's all out there. The book is called The Newsmongers, A History of Tabloid Journalism. I could go on, Terry, but I'm about to crash the news talking about the news. Where can people find you on X, Twitter, whatever we call it these days? Yeah, you can follow me on at Kirby London on, on Twitter. Um, I, 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 I don't do Instagram because there isn't room for it with me and the Kardashians. Indeed. Terry Kirby, thank you for your time today. Yeah.